Welcome, everybody. My name is Megan Golden, and I am co-director of Mission Cure. And I'm here today with my co-director, Linda Martin. Linda and I thank you for attending this Mission Cure webinar for patients and families on pancreatitis. And I'm happy to say that over to and 50 people have registered for the uh, topics that are timely and relevant for people dealing with chronic and recurrent acute pancreatitis. And today's webinar on pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and pancreatic enzymes focuses on a topic that we know patients have many questions about. And we're really honored to have an international expert on this topic, Dr. Stephen Friedman, here with us today. So just a few housekeeping items before we start. I need to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be in listen only mode, but we definitely want to hear your questions and comments. So uh, our presenter will address questions at the end of the webinar, but you can submit them at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you go to the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A icon. To type your question and click send. And you can also use that box to let us know if you're having any technical problems and we will try to help you. Um, the webinar recording will be posted on the Mission Cure website, YouTube channel, and Facebook page um, by sometime tomorrow, if not later today. So uh, next slide. Just a little bit about our agenda today. I will give a very brief um, uh, description of Mission Cure and I will introduce our speaker. And then Dr. Friedman will talk about pancreatic enzymes and the title of his talk is Busting the Myths. And uh, then we will have a Q&A session and leave plenty of time for that at the end. So, uh, Mission Cure is a nonprofit that was founded in late 2017 that's dedicated to developing life altering therapies for chronic and recurrent acute pancreatitis patients and bringing them to help people. We're using an innovative funding model based on improved patient outcomes and also partnering with forward thinking impact investors whose goals are to generate positive, measurable impact on people's health, as well as potential financial returns from the market. And uh, my background is in that type of financing. Uh, Linda and I and our small but very mighty team have engaged with well over a thousand patients and families, researchers, clinicians, government officials, industry representatives, and others to bring together the best minds to really problem solve and find solutions that meet the needs of patients and really to get everybody to focus on discovering effective treatments for pancreatitis. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of support from the whole scientific community as we work toward a cure or effective therapies. And we work closely with many organizations um, some of what you see here. We're especially grateful to AbbVie and our individual donors who have provided the funding to make our patient education program possible. So now I am delighted to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Steven Friedman. Uh, Dr. Friedman's director of the Pancreas Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. He's chief of the Division of Translational Research and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Friedman received his PhD from Yale University School of Medicine and an MD from the University of Connecticut. And he is an internationally recognized expert in exocrine pancreatic disease with a particular focus on pancreatitis and also cystic fibrosis. He's been a leader also in identifying the 
site in the brain where pain from pancreatitis is represented and has developed pain therapies using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which will have to be a topic for another webinar. Um, as co-founder of Mission Cure, I've found Dr. Friedman to be a really helpful advisor who is genuinely here because he wants to make patients better. And I'm thrilled to have him here to address this important topic. Now, before Dr. Friedman gets started, we're going to take a little poll. There are two questions. Um, and the first one is, if you are a patient or caregiver, do you or does the person you care for take pancreatic enzymes? And then second question, if the answer is yes, how confident are you that you are taking the right amount in the right way? So I will give people a few seconds here to, uh, to answer the questions. And uh, this information will help Dr. Friedman know who, who uh, his audience is here. So why don't we look at the results? All right, so 93% of the patients or family members do take pancreatic enzymes. And interestingly, only 11% of those are very confident that they're doing it right. So I, I think that your confidence should increase after this webinar. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Friedman. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's truly a, a privilege to be able to present to everyone here. Uh, and on this next slide, I am going to go through the objectives of what I'd like to cover over the next about uh, 25, 30 minutes or so. And the first aspect is what is pancreatic insufficiency and why is it so important to treat it? I'll then talk about how do we diagnose exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? How do we treat it once we've made that diagnosis? And then lastly, is pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy also helpful in treating the pain of chronic pancreatitis? So first of all, what is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? If you look at the cartoon diagram I have on the right side of the slide, most people think that all the digestion occurs in the stomach, but actually the stomach is only there to act as a reservoir. It's there to accommodate the meal that you take in and then gradually release that food into the beginning of the small intestine called the duodenum. And it's there in the duodenum that the pancreas is then activated and secretes up to two quarts or liter of, liters of fluid a day into the small intestine. And in addition, bile, which is made in the bile ducts of the liver, stored in the gallbladder, also is stimulated to be released into the small intestine and between the bile and the pancreatic juice. That's how you fully digest your meal. And if your pancreas isn't working, then you don't digest and it results in nutrient malabsorption. So what causes exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or EPI? First of all, we know that up to 90% of our patients with a condition called cystic fibrosis have almost complete loss of function of their pancreas. A lot of that occurs actually during pregnancy in utero. And in those patients, pancreatic enzymes are critical in digesting what they take in. We also know in chronic pancreatitis, up to a third of patients with that disease will develop exocrine pancreatic insufficiency over time. Usually it takes about a decade to develop, uh, perhaps up to 20 years. We also know that if you have part of your pancreas removed, that that also can result in exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And the previous webinar to this one was on TPIAT, total pancreatectomy, and obviously that results in complete reliance on pancreatic enzymes. Even in patients without known pancreatic disease, just being over the age of 50 or 60 
can be associated with mild EPI. Finally, the largest population of individuals who have EPI, it turns out it's all healthy infants up to six months of age. This is based on some older literature and we've confirmed it more recently in a paper by our group here, that it turns out that the infant pancreas makes proteases, the enzymes that break down proteins, but lipase, the enzyme that breaks down fats, and amylase, the enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates, is actually in breast milk. So as long as you're breast milk fed, then you can digest everything that you take in. Fast forward to modern times where infants are given infant formula and you miss the lipase and amylase, and these patients have some degree of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And with Cammie Martin, the neonatologist at our medical center, under her leadership, we showed that this is even more magnified as an issue, this malabsorption in preterm infants in the neonatal ICU. So how does pancreatic insufficiency present? I've mentioned these three different classes of enzyme, and if you don't have enough amylase, you'll malabsorb carbohydrates. If you don't have enough of the proteases, and those are enzymes like trypsin, you'll malabsorb proteins, and without enough lipase, you malabsorb fats. And together, the lack of these three different classes being fully absorbed results in symptoms, results in malnutrition, and in fact, in cystic fibrosis, before the advent of pancreatic enzymes, almost all infants with CF died in the first year of life, and hence pancreatic enzymes in patients with cystic fibrosis is literally life-saving. It can also predispose, if you have EPI, to bone disease because of lack of vitamin D, as well as systemic disease, that if you have malnutrition, it can affect other organs. In fact, as an example, in cystic fibrosis, your nutritional status at age four predicts your degree of lung function at age 16. So what are signs and symptoms? The main signs are something called steatorrhea, and this is as a result of the lack of enough lipase to break down fats. And if you can't break down fats, you will have these pale, oily, greasy stools. And one tip off that someone's truly having steatorrhea as opposed to just regular watery diarrhea is that the stool sticks to the walls of the toilet bowl. Just floating stools, that's not very specific, but the sticking phenomenon is a tip off of steatorrhea. And this can be associated with abdominal symptoms, not only this type of diarrhea, but bloating and gas and abdominal discomfort. In addition, this lack of enough lipase results in lack of efficient absorption of fat-soluble vitamins. And this is, includes the A, D, E, and K vitamins. And if you don't have enough vitamin A, you'll have night blindness and sometimes can be associated with a certain kind of rash. You can have metabolic bone disease. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you'll develop osteopenia, a thinning of the bones, or overt osteoporosis. If you don't have enough vitamin E, you can develop anemia and issues with nerves. And vitamin K is critical in synthesis of clotting factors in the liver and with vitamin K deficiency, you'll have increased bruising or bleeding. And one important thing to note is that if you need to supplement these fat-soluble vitamins and you're on pancreatic enzyme, you have to take the fat-soluble vitamins with your pancreatic enzyme. If you just take them in the middle of the day without enzymes, you won't be able to basically uh, absorb them and to, to keep your levels where they should be. So how do we diagnose EPI? And the old classic way was a 72-hour collection of your stool called a 72-hour fecal fat. You had to be on 100 grams of fat a day for three days. And if you had more than seven grams of fat per day in that total stool collection, uh, that would be highly consistent with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. There was another blood test called serum trypsinogen levels that we would measure. 
but the two of these basically aren't done anymore today and they've been replaced with two approaches. The first, which is now our basically gold standard, is to measure the amount of a pancreatic enzyme in your stool called fecal elastase. And the elastase normal values are greater than 200. And this could be on a spot stool sample. And you can still be on pancreatic enzyme supplementation. It will not interfere with this test. And if your value is much less than 200, especially less than 100 micrograms per gram of stool, then that's highly consistent with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Simple test, nothing special in your diet. The one caveat to remember is you have to supply a form stool. This is measuring a concentration of elastase, and many physicians don't pay attention or know about this aspect especially if you're a general physician, like an internist, that if it's on a just any diarrheal stool, since this measures concentration, it will be low no matter what the cause of your diarrhea is. So it has to be on a form stool to be a uh, meaningful result. So that's one approach. The other approach, in someone with known pancreatic disease, if they're developing what seem to be the classic signs and symptoms of steatorrhea, we just may give pancreatic enzymes and if there's a response to pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy or PERTS, then that's good enough that you are exocrine pancreatic insufficient. It's both diagnostic, your response, but it also it's now therapeutic. We have you on therapy. So what are PERTS or pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy? And are they actually a perfect replacement for what your own pancreas would make? So what these are, no matter what brand name you buy or get prescribed, basically it's just pig pancreas that's ground up, purified, and they extract the enzymes. It is not quite as good as what our own enzymes would do. These are given as coated little microspheres, uh, which is the majority of the enzyme preparations out there. Viocase is the only non-coated preparation. And they've been shown in clinical trials to improve protein and fat malabsorption and to help with the symptoms associated with EPI in both kids and adults. Uh, there are some risks. Uh, the main risk, which is incredibly rare, and it's only been seen in patients who have cystic fibrosis, is something called fibrosing colonopathy. It was associated with extremely high doses of PERTs, we're talking, for example, more than 10 to 12 Creon 24,000 lipase unit capsules with each main meal and like six to eight with snacks. And the reason it's only seen in cystic fibrosis is what happens is these enzymes are, don't dissolve in the intestine of a patient with cystic fibrosis because secretions are so thick and they go all the way into the colon. And in the colon, they literally get stuck to the beginning of the what's called ascending colon. And then they slowly release their enzymes over days to weeks to months and cause inflammation and scarring. There's also a theoretical viral transmission. If there's a virus in that pig pancreas, it potentially could be transmitted, although that's never been seen despite decades of using pancreatic enzymes. Enzyme capsules also contain something called purines, which are already elevated in patients with gout or kidney failure and potentially can trigger a bout of, uh, of gout to flare. There is a lot of work on the horizon, although not by many groups, mostly by mine, on developing a non-pig pancreas version of pancreatic enzymes. And uh, we're currently developing these and these are, uh, will soon be in clinical trials. There's also a version of enzymes that's in a cartridge that my group developed with a company called Alcresta. It's called Relizorb, and it's for people with tube feeds because if you put enzymes in the bag and someone getting tube feeds, it doesn't work. And we've shown in clinical trials in patients with cystic fibrosis, both kids and adults, that this significantly improves the uptake uh, of all the critical nutrients that are in an enteral tube feed and decreases symptom burden. So I'd like to just put up this brief history of PERTS because this is why it's so confusing to not only patients 
And I think that's illustrated in a little survey just before my talk here, but also to physicians. And before 2010, despite the fact you actually had to write a prescription for enzymes, FDA approval was not required. Consistency and activity of these enzymes was all over the map. There were all kinds of generic over-the-counter formulations, which made it more confusing. And no one knew exactly how to dose these. And as a result of this fibrosing colonopathy in 2010, FDA said, I think we need to now oversee this process. They required approval, although we're talking up to 20 patients in clinical trials, and it was very rapid approval. It helped ensure consistency is now uh, consistent, basically, and shown to, that there's efficacy of these enzyme preps. Prescriptions are required, but there's still a lot of confusion over dosing and administration, and you'll see why on this next slide. The problem is we have these different enzyme preps, Creon, Zenpep, Pancreas, Altressa, Viocase, uh, Pertzi, but look at all the different doses that are out there. It's very confusing to providers who are writing prescriptions as well as to patients. And you can see that it's not only different dosing, uh, but you can see the doses are very different depending on what PrEP we're talking about here. I'll just mention on Viocase that because this is the only non-coded enzyme preparation, it does require patients to be on an acid blocker uh, daily. How do you take these PERTs? And so now we just have to step back and think about, so how does your own exocrine pancreas normally work in response to a meal? And your pancreas is actually very clever. Depending on that meal, like for example, how much fat you take in, the more fat you take in, the pancreas senses this and automatically would increase the amount of lipase it would secrete. Plus, the larger the meal, the more enzymes and fluid your pancreas would secrete in response to that meal. So we're trying to basically emulate or mimic what your own pancreas would do in response to that meal. So when patients say, okay, just tell me how many pills I take with every meal and with snacks, and that's it. We have to have a longer discussion. Well, it really depends on what you're eating, the composition of that meal and the size of that meal. So we usually tell people you wanna take the enzymes with the first bite of a meal. The main mistake that doctors will make, especially internists, they'll tell people to take it, oh, why don't you take your enzymes about 30 minutes before a meal and at bedtime? Well, if it's not mixing with your food, it won't do anything. So that dosing regimen doesn't work. So you wanna take it with the first bite of your meal. Second, is that you want to consider adding it during or towards the end of a meal, especially if a meal is longer than 20 minutes. I'll split up the dose. So if a meal is like 20 minutes or so, I have people take half the number of capsules with the first bite, half in the middle of the meal. If it's more than 30 minutes long their meal, I'll have people take a third with the first bite, a third of their dose in the middle of the meal, and a third of the number of capsules or dose at the end of the meal really mimicking what you're taking in. And if it's a larger meal or a fattier meal, I usually have people take one or two or extra capsules with that meal. Smaller meals, they can potentially take less. In addition, you wanna make sure there's adequate hydration because that's important in these enzyme capsules dissolving in, especially in the small intestine. In patients with cystic fibrosis, where all the secretions are extra thick, this is even more critical. Sometimes adding an acid blocker will help in these enzymes dissolving, and it helps with the, especially lipase activation, the enzyme that breaks down fats. It turns out that the optimum pH for lipase is around pH 8. Normally, in the intestine, the pH is, is less than 6. Side effects, it's not absorbed, so really minimal side effects. You know, some people will call up afterwards and say, hey, I took the enzyme, I'm having horrible constipation as a side effect. Well, that just means that's probably what the real state of your bowel is, because these enzymes should not cause constipation. And instead, we want to give that sufficient dosing of enzyme, but then treat uh, with Miralax or whatever else helps if constipation is an issue. 
older formulations of enzymes are associated with potential flare of gout, as I mentioned. So how do we dose based on age? This is the FDA indications for dosing. In infants, it's 2,000 to, 2, to 4,000 units per four ounces of formula or breast milk. If you're a child under age four, it's 1,000 units per kilogram body weight per meal or 500 units per kilogram per snack. And if you're age four and over, it's exactly the same dose, whether now pediatric or adult which is 500 units per kilogram body weight per meal, or half that dose is snack. And because of this risk of fibrosing colonopathy, the dose should not be over 2,500 lipase units per kilogram of body weight. Uh, so in a 60 kilogram person, i.e. 132 pound individual, who's an adult, that would translate to six creon 24,000 lipase unit capsules per meal. And that's usually around our full dose. So that's someone who's had total pancreatectomy, so TPIAT, or cystic fibrosis, or has complete uh, destruction of their pancreas from pancreatitis. So we know compliance is tough. And there's a number of reasons that's the case. First of all, this is lifelong Com commitment to taking pancreatic enzyme. It's taking a large quantity of capsules with every meal. And that's why research, especially in our group, is looking at developing a different version of these enzymes where it's one capsule would be sufficient per meal. You have to remember the timing with a meal, uh, especially if you're out at an event or a restaurant. It's not always easy to remember to take your enzymes throughout a meal that may go on for an hour or longer. You know, people have chronic underlying disease with depression. And so this just adds that coping burden that you're trying to address. And especially adherence during adolescence and into young adulthood is more of an issue. You know, people are going to college or they're in high school, for example, they're around all their, their friends and they don't wanna be seen taking a whole bunch of enzyme capsules throughout a meal. And young women in particular may not want to take the full dose because they're trying to minimize gaining weight. They may have a certain body image. Uh, and so they may not take their full enzyme complement as a way to lose weight, which is obviously not ideal. So what are approaches to improving compliance? And these include educating both the patient as well as their family, that's important talking about dietary recommendations and bringing in a dietitian, and that this really is not easy. It's lifelong therapy that's required. And even in cystic fibrosis, where we know that this is potentially a life-saving therapy, and it's also very important in people who have, who have chronic pancreatitis or have had TPIAT, that you know, this is not easy. And we know compliance rates are at best perhaps 60%. Self-monitoring your weight at home, you know, is probably an important uh, thing to look, be looking at here. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation on their website has these grab and go ideas. So what are snacks or things you can bring? Uh, and it makes it a little easier to figure out what your pancreatic enzyme dosing is, or you're making mini meals. And I tell people, you know what? You may not remember to bring all these capsules with you to every single meal. Uh, especially if you're in a work environment or school environment, you know, put them in a book bag, coat pockets, put them in your regular pant pockets, you know, anywhere you can where you'll be able to have more easily access. And it's important to just have a very open communication, especially during life transitions, to figure out you know, how can we work with someone in their family to try to make this easy and also you know, really have a dietitian involved. So lastly, what about PERTs for chronic pancreatitis? And there's been some very nice clinical trials. This dates back to the 1970s by Dr. Phil Toskus. He's, he's long since retired. He was at University of Florida in Gainesville. And what he showed is that viocase, as the only quick-release form of pancreatic enzymes, may help with the pain of chronic pancreatitis, especially in 
younger patients up to age 40, especially in younger women. And these were patients without a dilated pancreatic duct. And there's been lots of studies showing that the other PERTs, Creon, Zenpep, et cetera, all the slower release enzyme preparations don't work. Uh, so why is it that Viocase should work and works in about 40% of patients with pain of chronic pancreatitis? So if you go back to our cartoon diagram on the right, so when food goes into the in upper intestine, that turns on little sensors in that beginning of the intestine, and they turn on the release of the main hormone that stimulates the pancreas. That hormone's called cholecystokinin or CCK. And what Viocase does is the only quick release prep is because it's all rapidly released just in the upper intestine, unlike all the other enzyme versions that are slower released throughout the whole intestine. Those high levels of enzymes from Viocase, especially one called trypsin, it actually inactivates those sensors. Those sensors aren't, they turned off, they don't turn on stimulation of the pancreas, and so it's a way to eat and minimally stimulate your pancreas, while at the same time, all those viocase enzymes will still help in fully digesting your meal. So it's a way to rest the pancreas, but still get full digestion. I'll just mention on the side that people with celiac disease can have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So if we go back one slide, so even though uh, their pancreas is normal in celiac disease, that upper intestine, you actually lose those sensors. And so the pancreas is not working right, it's not turned on. So in celiac disease, the pancreas isn't being stimulated to secrete even though you have a normal pancreatic gland. And the treatment is gluten-free diet and that will get the pancreas turned back on. So on the final slide here, so take home points, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, it should be suspected in anyone who has loss of normal exocrine pancreatic function, so people especially with chronic pancreatitis, and in people who also have symptoms of EPI, so weight loss, bloating, oily stools. It can be diagnosed by fecal elastase testing on a random stool sample, it needs to be formed, or if we have strong clinical suspicion, just a clear response to putting someone on pancreatic enzymes. I've mentioned that these PERTs, they're life-saving in cystic fibrosis, but also play a critical role in people with chronic pancreatitis or other exocrine pancreatic disease, but they need to be given at the correct dose, and that's based on size of a meal, the amount of fat that has to be given during a meal, so that correct timing is critical, and that, especially in patients who don't have a dilated pancreatic duct, uh, it may help with the pain of chronic pancreatitis. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Friedman. Um, there was so much valuable information in there um, that I know you've already addressed a lot of people's questions, but we do have questions coming in, have gotten some already. So let's uh, get right to those. Um, for those of you on the call, please keep sending in your questions or as we go through these, um, if you think of others, feel free to go ahead and uh, um, type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to just as many as we can. Okay, so um, Dr. Friedman, we have gotten a few questions that are, I'm going to sort of give them to you together because they're sort of in the same uh, category and it's around uh, one, one patient says that uh, they have been diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis with atrophy and is asking, does taking enzymes help slow down the atrophy process? And maybe I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll let you answer that and come back to the others that are in that same sort of category. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the answer is probably not, you know, based on uh, studies in animal models of, of pancreatic disease. Uh, we would like for enzymes to kind of slow down this process of atrophy, but probably we need to instead be targeting the underlying chronic pancreatitis 
to try to minimize the inflammation and scarring uh, to minimize that, that atrophy process. Okay, um, that's helpful. Um, and then um, sort of along those lines, um, someone has asked, even though they haven't been diagnosed with EPI, is there a benefit to starting on PERT? Probably not. Uh, these aren't absorbed, so usually there's no side effects. I think one question that uh, is, is kind of being proposed here is, would this help prevent the development of EPI? And there's really no data that supports that, that that would prevent that from, from happening down the road. You know, I think it, since these, these enzymes are not perfect, they don't really completely enhance what your own enzymes will do, probably no role for, for taking them. And plus you end up having to take obviously, you know, you know, these capsules with every single meal. So there's a fair amount of effort that's required, you know, being on enzymes all the time here. There is uh, no clear data, but sometimes we will use enzymes, especially biocase is the only quick release enzyme to see whether or not it may help prevent recurrent acute episodes of pancreatitis in patients who are having very frequent bouts that are putting them in the hospital. You know, we're talking about bouts, you know, every like three or four weeks in that kind of realm. Okay. And then uh, two questions um, around, first of all, why did it take my doctor so long to prescribe PERT? And sort of along those same lines, what is the risk of starting PERT too soon? I have a low fecal test, but my doctor said no need to start PERT because I have no symptoms. So maybe you can address that sort of the timing of getting started. Yeah, so there are very few people that have expertise in exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and the use of PERTs. Yeah, I think cystic fibrosis doctors get a lot of training in this, but otherwise there's very little training. And as I mentioned, there's just so much confusion with dosing. In addition, it is very difficult to get these covered through insurance carriers nowadays. Uh, we spend much of our time uh, having to do prior authorizations to see if we can even get these approved, even in patients with pancreatic cancer who are absolutely exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I think there's been some confusion in the past, and I did have an invited publication about the myths of, ex, of PERTs and how to use them. Uh, and one of the major journals was published in the past year. Uh, so hopefully that's helping to educate people. I think in part, some doctors do rely on symptoms and they don't realize that there can be malabsorption of specific nutrients such as the fat soluble vitamins and people may not have symptoms but by the time they have symptoms they've malabsorbed so much for example of vitamin d that now they have significant osteoporosis or they're having issues with clotting factors so i think it's important to if you're working up and evaluating someone for epi that if you find it you probably want to then treat at that point and treat, you probably need lower doses of these enzymes. So we're talking one or two Creon 24,000 with each main meal, maybe one with snacks as one example uh, to use here versus someone who's has severe EPI and now you're at six capsules with each main meal. So I think if you work it up and you're suspecting EPI, you should probably be treating it here. If you're uh, if someone's clearly having any symptoms at all, loose stools, oily stools, bloating, gas, then for sure you want to be treating this. Uh, so if I'm putting someone through testing for EPI, usually I'll tell people, well, if I find it abnormal, we're going to go ahead and treat. Good. So um, next, um, there are several questions. Um, I think um, that, that there's confusion about as we all know, there's confusion about dosing. It's, it's very complicated, especially with the different formulas. But in addition, you had mentioned that, um, that, that there might be a change in dose based on the fat content of the meal. And so there's uh, several questions around 
first of all, whether to dose based on um, kind of body weight versus amount of fat, and is there any way to calculate a dose um, for a particular size person, um, sort of like someone might calculate insulin to carb ratios, um, you know, by grams of fat in a meal or some other formula. And then sort of finally um, around that same sort of topic is, um, should um, a person be keeping their fat below a certain amount um, and, and not have to worry quite as much about dosing the, the PERT? So um, kind of throw all those at once because they're all related to, uh, to the fat content of a meal and dosing. Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. The FDA, in their approval of PERTs, did it based on body weight. And those of us who are experts in this area as well, and there aren't that many, and those of us who, uh, in addition, have, have done all the studies, both in animal models and humans, and have studied physiology of the pancreas, the pancreas does not secrete based on your body weight. It secretes uh, based on what you take in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, size of the meal, amount of fat, amount of protein, et cetera. Um, so, you know, generally I, I spend about 40 to 60 minutes in an office visit talking about dosing of pancreatic enzymes in my patients. I'll go through very carefully their diet, how long it takes to eat a meal. And generally, I, this is, take this a little bit of grain of salt, but this is kind of my, my overview of how I think about it. And, and it does fit with how we're trying to mimic what your own enzymes would normally do if you had a healthy pancreas. If I think someone has mild exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and, uh, and I'll give, for example, Creon 24,000 lipase unit capsules as an example. If you're um, age six and above, if you have mild excrement pancreatic insufficiency, I'll tell people probably take like one to three creons with a meal, smaller meals, one, larger meal, three, and one with snacks. If you have moderate exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, then I'll tell people, why don't you take like two to five? Again, two with smaller meals, five with larger meals or a very fatty meal. Uh, and if you have severe exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, we're now in the five to seven, five to nine with each main meal, nine for a very large meal, five or so with much smaller meals and with snacks. And if you go out and have a you know, super fatty meal, 100 grams of fat, and then you have, uh, I have nothing to do with any of these companies, by the way, Ben and Jerry's ice cream loaded with fat, hot fudge sundae, which right now sounds really good to me. Uh, that's probably like a nine to 12 Creon with that meal. So uh, you just wanna kind of uh, use that kind of range in thinking about this. Uh, so there's not a magic formula necessarily, and also like carb counting, matching that to the amount of insulin you would need. There's not exactly that kind of thing. It's more just uh, looking at the size of the meal and more just the amount of fat, protein, doesn't make as much of a difference how much protein is there. And then I'll tell people, if you're at a restaurant, you know, you think you're going to eat a meal in 30 minutes, turns out the meal's dragging on forever because it's a great meal, a great company. And you took a third with the first bite, a third of your capsules at 15 minutes, you took a third at 30 minutes, and now you're still eating for another 40 minutes, take another, you know, three or four capsules. Otherwise, that last half of your meal won't see the enzymes and potentially it would just go right through you. And in part, patients learn after a while, you're gonna have terrible steatorrhea if you don't take enough enzymes throughout, throughout that meal here. Okay, um, good. Um, so here's a question about, is there a vegan pancreatic enzyme available that you might recommend? There isn't. And people who have a pork allergy, people who keep strict kosher. Uh, these, all the enzymes are, are the same pig pancreas ground up batch. Uh, so those are issues. That's in part why, for example, our group is working on a non-pig pancreas. A, a, uh, basically, it turns out a number of bacteria produce these enzymes like lipase. 
and we've been purifying them out. Uh, and this is me working with uh, a couple of different biotech companies. And we're looking at recombinant or other versions that uh, so would basically get around vegan or pork based. Okay. Well, there's a business opportunity for someone. Um, so um, also, um, what advice would you give for someone trying to figure out whether they are taking too much PERT or another question that along those lines, what are the symptoms of taking too much PERT? So the, the main concern we have, if you took too much PERT, is this incredibly rare condition of fibrosis and colonopathy. We're talking, I don't know, like 10 or 12 case reports worldwide over all these years. And we don't seem to see this anymore with this uh, FDA restriction at uh, 10,000 lipase units per kilogram body weight per day. Um, there's really no side effects of taking too many PERTs other than it's just a lot of capsules you have to end up consuming per day. As I said, it will not cause constipation or other side effects. What I usually like to do is I like to find what is the optimum enzyme amount that someone should take. And what I'll do is I think, you know, if I've made the diagnosis of EPI, whether it's based on fecal last days, whether it's based on clinical symptom, I will put people on the higher end of dosing. So if they have severe exquin pancreatic insufficiency, I may have people start at six to nine Creon 24,000s or 69 Zempep 25,000 with each main meal. And we'll do that for a week or so. I wanna see is there a clinical response, i.e. fewer bowel movements, they're much more form, no oily stool stuck to the walls of the toilet bowl, gas and bloating, et cetera, is better. Once we see a clear response, then I'll have people titrate down and see, you know, instead of six to nine, is this, you know, seven with a, a, you know, with a larger meal and four with a smaller meal. Now, people adjust the enzymes and people usually can pretty quickly over a couple of weeks realize what dose uh, that at a level you get less than that, you start to get more bloating and gas and especially oily stools as, as the readout. And then, you know, okay, that's too low and you should come up on the dose. With the exception of cystic fibrosis, you really cannot take too many capsules. I mean, just no fun to obviously be taking more than nine capsules with a main meal and probably don't need to be taking more than nine in an otherwise, uh, you know, uh, normal weight adult. As far as, I think there was a question earlier about, you know, should I be on a really low fat diet? In cystic fibrosis, there in the past has been very clear clinical trials showing that low fat dose, low fat diets with low dose of pancreatic enzyme, patients with cystic fibrosis had much worse outcomes. It was better to put them on 100 grams of fat a day, so high fat diets, and give them much more pancreatic enzymes. Uh, we don't know so much is that exactly what we should do if you have chronic pancreatitis. In chronic pancreatitis, we usually have our patients on lower fat diets, so 40 grams or less, just because high fat tends to rev up their pancreatitis and their pain. So usually we will tell people, and this is kind of more generic statement, may not apply to everyone, that if you have chronic pancreatitis and active symptoms of chronic pancreatitis with pain, probably make your total fat around 30 to 40 grams of fat a day and take whatever the appropriate amount of pancreatic enzymes would be. Okay. Uh, and so we have a question here. One person has asked, um, does drinking water, um, a glass or more of water with a meal, cause the enzymes to move through the stomach faster? In other words, does it wash the enzymes away before they can start working? Yeah. Um, they may only to a very small extent. Definitely taking fluids with enzymes is a good thing. Whether you have chronic pancreatitis, whether they have cystic fibrosis, there's decreased secretion of fluids from the pancreas. And if you have less secretions, these enzyme capsules don't dissolve very well and they don't work very well. 
You don't necessarily have to take lots and lots of fluids, but you should take at least probably eight ounces of fluid. Again, just kind of giving you a ballpark figure here with every main meal, that's probably reasonable. You're not necessarily just going to flush the enzymes through and they won't, they won't work. It's the opposite. Uh, hydration is actually something that may help their activity and help with their mixing of food. Okay. Um, now switching gears here a little bit, we have several questions regarding the cost of PERT. Um, uh, some people have said it's very expensive. The size of the dose requires me to take a lot and that's expensive. Um, my copay is over $400, but I, my income is too high for assistance. Any ideas on getting it at a lower cost? So any advice you might have on, on paying for, for, for PERT and the appropriate doses of PERT? Yeah, I mean, these are very expensive. Um, that said, uh, AbbVie and many of these uh, companies who produce PERTs, I know AbbVie for sure. Um, so if you're on Creon, they do have assistance programs. In part, it, it, it may also relate to what your income is, but they have assistance programs. And definitely through your physician or you can otherwise explore if there can be some help with the cost of these enzymes. You know, we uh, as physicians nowadays, uh, we, we try to deal a lot with these prior authorizations. And if someone truly has exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, uh, as physicians, we can usually uh, get at least one of the formulations of pancreatic enzyme uh, to get approved by your insurance company. The only caveat is, and, uh, and I'm not an aficionado in this area, but uh, patients on Medicare dealing with the donut hole, it's definitely a huge issue. But again, reach out to these companies and uh, they do have some assistance programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question here about, are there other causes for EPI in children besides cystic fibrosis? And I don't know from the way the question was asked, but I'm assuming this child has not been diagnosed with pancreatitis either. So we do have other causes of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. The classic one in a child, it's called schwachmann diamond syndrome. Um, and Peter Dury, he was, he was a pediatric GI CF doc, the world leader, and, and everything I've been talking about who recently died. It was a huge loss to our field. Uh, but Peter Dury and his group are the world leaders in Schwachmann Diamond. These patients present usually with EPI as they're presenting symptom. Usually they're of shorter stature, so it's kind of stunted growth. It can affect your blood counts. Um, so that's one cause, and the genetics of that are, have been uh, recently worked out over the past few years. Uh, other causes are celiac disease, which is not true pancreatic destruction, as I mentioned, but can present exactly like this because you're not stimulating the pancreas to turn on. Uh, so that's another cause. You know, I, we occasionally have rare patients who have no known chronic pancreatitis or pancreatitis in general, no cystic fibrosis, and present with selective EPI. And we don't find another cause, but obviously we treat this. Uh, so we don't always come up with a, a clear indication, but uh, it's important to, to evaluate the pancreas and these other uh, etiologies here. Okay, um, well, we just have a couple more minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask just uh, maybe two more questions and then remind um, the participants that if we don't get to your question, I apologize, but uh, Dr. Friedman will have an opportunity to review all the questions and we will post answers either on our website or get back to the person who asked them. So no worries, we'll, we'll get answers one way or another. Um, so one more question about the um, effect of PERT on insulin and diabetes. Basically a couple of questions of, um, do we need to be careful with either the amount of PERT or uh, adjust our insulin and are they 
correlated or have any impact on each other? Yeah, so wonderful question. Uh, I'm going to take it in two parts. The first part is it's no accident that the endocrine aspect of the pancreas, uh, i.e., they, these islets of Langerhans, in, which includes the cells that secrete insulin, it's no accident they're buried with the exocrine part of the pancreas, the cells that make digestive enzyme. There's a lot of crosstalk between them. And if you have, if you have chronic pancreatitis and or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency for whatever cause, that can af affect and blunt the insulin release from your islets. The converse, if you have diabetes, that can lead to a relative exocrine pancreatic insufficiency without insulin, which is also a hormone that keeps your acinar cells, the cells that make digestive enzyme, keeping those cells healthy. Uh, you can develop EPI if you have diabetes as your primary underlying cause. As far as the enzymes and taking them and impact on diabetes and your blood sugars, uh, big effect. If you're not on sufficient amount of enzymes and you're a diabetic, if you malabsorb, you're going to have less nutrients taken up. You'll have less glucose or blood sugar taken up because you won't have all that amylase. And that's going to affect if you're on insulin or you're on pills or injections of other things. Uh, so if you're malabsorbing, you're going to have less of the sugar and these other nutrients taken up and your requirements are going to be less. And then all of a sudden, if you put on pancreatic enzyme and you fully address being exocrine pancreatic insufficient, now you're going to absorb blood, you absorb sugars, fats, proteins, all these things much more. And now all of a sudden your blood sugars are going to skyrocket and your insulin or any other drugs you're on to treat diabetes, your requirements are going to be a lot high, higher. So many of our patients with chronic pancreatitis, for example, who are diabetic, and now we diagnose them that have EPI, I warn them that you really want to watch your blood sugars carefully the moment we put you on pancreatic enzyme because you're probably going to need more insulin or metformin or whatever it may be. So you need to keep a close eye on what your blood sugars are going to do. So clearly there's a, a, a lot of interaction uh, between them here. And, and by the way, just as we're talking about enzyme, you know, I keep talking about prescription enzyme. There are a lot of quite a few different products over the counter that are quote pancreatic enzymes or quote digestive aids. Uh, be very careful. These are totally unregulated and most of the over the counter pancreatic enzyme are not active whatsoever. They're totally degraded. Nothing is working. Uh, you're basically wasting your money. So uh, I haven't found any enzymes over the counter that truly are what they say they are. Okay, thank you, Dr. Friedman. Um, that was just fantastic. Um, unfortunately, although we still have questions, um, we do have to wrap up our uh, Q&A session now. I want to be respectful of everyone's time and we're right at an hour. Um, but as I said, we will uh, post uh, answers to the questions we didn't get to on our website. Um, we hope also that if you haven't already, you will consider joining our effort. There's a lot of ways you can get involved with Mission Cure and help raise awareness and hope. Please join our email list on our website, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, like us on Facebook, and share our blogs and posts. And we hope you will let people know about this and future webinars. The bigger our patient community we have, the more influence we will have on research and funding. And I also want to let you know that we're in the process of developing a chronic pancreatitis patient and family portfolio. The details are still coming together, but we really want to share your stories about how chronic and recurrent acute pancreatitis affects you and your family. Send us an email if you'd be interested in sharing your experiences, and we'll get in touch as soon as we can. And again, um, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. 